thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I will use this situation just to, uh, sorry for a bit delay, but uh, I think we, uh, we have a wonderful time ahead of us. And thank you very much for, for coming. And uh, maybe just to mention, if you haven't been here yesterday, uh, MOVO is organized by Oficina. This is eighth year of the conference. And we've always had the intention to bring the best speakers from around the world uh, to give you the best talks. And I've, uh, I think that uh, the, the proof that you always come is, um, is, uh, is the best. And uh, this year's theme called uh, New Point O uh, started as a bit of a joke of uh, versioning in design and the constant uh, never-ending search for uh, new styles and new identities. But throughout the year, you know, uh, a lot of technology emerged uh, and to be, uh, uh, to be you know, op open for, for public use. And we thought, yeah, of course, we have to, <laughs> we have to jump on the bandwag bandwagon as well and uh, talk about AI a bit uh, as well. So I'm uh, really excited to have um, the biggest discussion panel we've ever had, <laughs> uh, because we've added more people. Uh, unfortunately, Nando Costa's not joining. Uh, but uh, let's, uh, let's start. Uh, and I have a very, very uh, prepared warm-up question. And I have, to, uh, I have to be honest with you, I'm really skeptical about using AI in creative industry. And uh, even like more than skeptical, I'm quite bored. Uh, so uh, I would like all the panelists uh, I would like to ask them, persuade me, like, why should I care at, at, at all? <laughs> so uh, we're, we can go uh, so from I this direction, and then we ask our participants online. Hello. So my name is Christoph Grünberger. I'm working at the design agency and advertising agency in Germany called Jung von Mott. And we as an agency have also implemented AI in our working process, and if you want to ask the question why it is relevant. I think it's, um, it's just the consequence of a development. So we are now at the point of accumulation where this technique is going into the design area as a, simply as a tool. And it's, yes, it's quite kind of a, of a disruption. But as someone said, you cannot even uh, invent erect electric light by constantly improving candles. So this is just the next step, <coughs> and we all have to, or we, we may accept the, the benefits also, because if you, if you use it, it will bring a lift of creativity, I think, by reducing your investment of time into the execution. So you have a lot of more time doing the concept and less in the, in the, in the making. So this is my outtake. Okay, nice try. So <laughs> next one. <laughs> check, check. <laughs> okay, hello everyone. My name is Tim Rodenbrücker. I'm a creative coding educator, basically. That's I'm much more than that, human being and so on. But, you know, um, I am happy to be here and uh, because I will probably maybe take the counter position to your statement. Um, I'm pretty skeptical about AI because I believe that it is not just affecting, let's say, you know, the micro level, but especially the macro level. We cannot really foresee the consequences. And, uh, yeah, I'm super happy to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation and looking forward. Oh, if mine. Uh, okay, so maybe I will be um, again like more optimistic, uh, so that we can switch uh, switch the opinions. Uh, I think like AI, like it's not nothing scary. It's basically like a piece of technology, and uh, uh, we are already using uh, technology like pretty much everywhere, including in art. Like uh, people are using cameras, and maybe like a hundred years ago, some uh, some some people would have the opinion that we should not really do this. We should draw everything by hand, otherwise it doesn't count. And you know, like there's some truth to it, uh, but also like there are some truths that uh, if you start using the technology you can uh, create some content uh, faster maybe it's not better in in some specific way but if it's more efficient in some other way uh, it, uh, it can have its place on the market so I think that uh, it's not uh, whether AI can replace everything that uh, creative people do but whether it can actually help them to uh, get to some subset of the work they are doing faster more efficient to, so that they can make more money and be more successful and I think in this case uh, it's uh, it's not so much uh, the question whether whether AI is gonna replace all 
all the creative people, but whether it's uh, going to be a, a useful tool for some subset of their work, I'm pretty sure uh, that this is the case. OK, you almost got me. So <laughs> let's, let's move on. So my opinion, I think it will be definitely influenced by my background, as is in the new media art or digital art uh, theory. Um, I would say that I would uh, prefer the skeptical approach to AI, uh, not because um, I, am, I don't believe in that evolution, but because for me it's more like um, postmodern approach, more rational one, um, because I think that the public discussion is uh, very much driven by the naive optimism or um, s s fear, and uh, there is not so much uh, even basic knowledge how it really works, and not so much discussion how it can be used in creative industries. Um, another uh, thing that I would tell to skeptical uh, person is that I think it's impossible to persuade uh, in the any industry without uh, um, like learn new things and I think the development of the disciplines goes with development of technology and tools and techniques and uh, maybe I would use also some um, example from the history of uh, development of media. It will be example from the um, uh, invention of photography because there, it was quite similar hype in that moment uh, among scientists, entrepreneurs, but also artists that were really scared that they will lose their jobs because nobody will want the portrait of their grandma or father or uh, forest they own or the castle and uh, uh, in the end, it turns that it was fresh air to the history of um, art uh, because uh, the modern um, art movements like impressionism, cubism, abstract art, this all was possible to develop thanks to photography that served as a cheap, fast tool for mere uh, representation, mimetic representation of reality. So I'm optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> cool, thank you very much for that. That kind of reminds me a story uh, in, the de in the development of uh, broadcast design uh, that uh, I read during the early years at uh, BBC, uh, you know, when, the, when all the design was hand-painted uh, and they started to hire graphic designers, the uh, uh, lettering artists and uh, hand-painters, they were afraid to lose their jobs and they, they were calling them uh, lettrusted uh, designers as they were like a second league artists for them, uh, but uh, yeah, the end of story is uh, they, they lost their jobs, <laughs> but that's just, a, uh, just a side note. Uh, I, I wanted to say hi to uh, our uh, panelists online. Uh, I'm really excited to, to have you there. Uh, we can, we can see, see you brilliantly, and uh, I will start with uh, Alš Bieta to, with, with the same question. Why should I care uh, about AI uh, as a creative person? I will ask you a question. Have you tried AI already? Because if you did, uh, you would uh, see that it's a very powerful tool. I will now sound very optimistic, uh, but uh, I have to say that, for instance, from my conversations with uh, chat GPT or trying a text to image in Canva, I was very excited what the tool can do. Of course, it has limitations. But it enabled me, and I'm not in the creative field. I'm uh, uh, from academia, so my main purpose is not to create images, etc. But still, it is a powerful tool for me to help me to create nice presentation, to optimize the uh, the view of, of you know, like the illustration of the presentation, etc. And as uh, Tomáš said, it is a powerful tool that we need to use. It's going to make us much more efficient, and it's going to, uh, yes, it's going to replace some people, unfortunately, but those people are going to change their professions and get even better in something else. And I would say it is also a tool that is going to help us and inspire us because it's talking back to us. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. And uh, then I give word to uh, Sara with the same uh, introduction, introductory question. 
Um, yeah, hello everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, brilliant. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, uh, yeah, so um, a as an archaeologist and evolutionary anthropologist, um, I, I got to say that we've had this discussion uh, many times as humanity about like wh who is going to be replaced by a specific technology and who's going to not be replaced. I think I have a question for you. How much of the creative work that you do is actually creative? Um, because a lot of the work is just admin, bureaucracy, creating presentations no one's ever going to read, creating graphic manuals, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, for example, recently, actually with Tomash, hello Tomash, we've been at um, Comic-Con and there have been discussions, for example, about the um, uh, translation and the subtitles of Kingdom Come and the dubbing. Um, and they managed to get it down from 4,000 hours of dubbing into 40. Now, that's the kind of money that you can then use to make the game even better and to make the game even more, uh, more accurate and fantastic. Um, for me, in archaeology, um, yes, there's that whole Indiana Jones vibe of finding a pyramid, which is great. The statistical chance of that happening to you as an archaeologist are very, very small. So if I can use machine learning to, for example, automate the search for various objects in the Egyptian desert, um, I can actually find them a lot quicker and save that money to give to students to make sure that archaeology as a field progresses much faster. Uh, and there's a concrete example of that happening that the new discipline of space archaeology has been developed recently under uh, uh, Dr. Sarah Parkins. Uh, and they actually found 16 pyramids like this about 10 years ago. So it's a fantastic tool. I think it's great. I don't think it's blind optimism. I think it's just the same way that you would understand the brush or the tempera being invented around the time of impressionism um, and using that to paint harder, better, faster, stronger images. And uh, I think it's just a new way uh, of uh, revolutionizing the creative industry. I think it's fantastic. And I think it gives us uh, a lot more opportunities to grow and evolve. Thank you very much. I'm getting really hyped and I think uh, Linus will get me a last shot, <laughs> the final one, uh, uh, where I would really get it. So <laughs> now, now it's your, your, your time. <laughs> I'll do my best. So hi, I'm Linus. Um, I call myself an AI gardener. Uh, I am a designer by trade. I've been in the creative industry for 20 years almost. And um, this is a tool we're talking about generative AI, we're talking about AI in design art and, and in the industry. It's a tool just like Photoshop was a tool when it came around. And when Photoshop came around, a lot of people were anxious. They were like, oh, don't touch my dark room. Um, and then look what happened. Uh, the entire industry switched and everyone was using Photoshop. The problem is Photoshop is like, has the power of uh, a hand drill, whereas like AI has the power of like, uh, a, a uh, 2000 nuclear plants strung together. So we're comparing two very different things, but the impact will be the same. Um, I'm 100% positive. And just for me, for example, to give you something that might persuade you, in the past four months, uh, I've generated more than 10,000 visual outputs based on ideas that I've had. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever made 10,000 outputs in my entire career in, in 20 years. Uh, maybe close to it, maybe something like that. So I've just done the same amount in four months that I've done in 20 years. So that tells you a lot about how fast I can move and iterate on my own thoughts. Um, and then it's like, I think we should look at AI again as tools. Uh, they're not going to replace creative people. I think they're going to augment and enhance. And if you're if you're not paying attention now, it's it's going to be it's going to be costly down the road because if if you're sitting on your lawyers for the next two years, um, a lot of other people might run faster than you, and then it will become hard to become competitive because the advancements that we're seeing right now they're so fast uh we're not we're not talking about months we're not talking about years we're talking about weeks uh maybe some days even days um so yeah i, I would get super excited about what they can do uh, and not be afraid and i would take the mindset of of uh of going back to like when you were a kid and you were playing around in in uh in the kin like in the kindergarten or in the playground and just be ruthlessly fearless about these tools that you are in command um, and don't get scared about what media, like the, the mainstream media is saying, uh, touch the tools. That's my, that's my, that's my recommendation. Thank you for having me. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much. So yeah. Uh, yeah, you, I think you, you did a good, good job and I will, I'm, I'm not uh, as bored as I, I, I was before. <laughs> can I, can I add here something in this yeah. context? Because it, it is exactly what we did. We had a workshop yesterday. Um, with the guys from Formlab, Vital Auto, and 
Paul Hayes actually has birthday today, so happy birthday, Paul Hayes. <laughs> so, and, and what we experienced was we had like very motivated students coming in, being very yeah, eager to, to work on the, on the systems, but what they were missing was the ramp up. So there was no way, because it's with obstacles, ob obstacles at the moment to have, you have to install Discord, you need a beta version of blah, 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 and so on. And we introduced them in this workshop to the systems and let them play with them in the end. And they all four or five of them were super ambitious and had the, the idea, as he said, Linus said, that you become the curator of your output. So the machine is generating on your ideas, on your prompts. You can then control this by manipulating the input. And it's in the end, it's like a conversation with the machine. So please imagine, blah, blah, blah. And you can then, as a, as a creative, you can curate the output of the machine and therefore are able to, to save a lot of uh, time. Yeah, that, that uh, goes, goes right in the direction of my next question that I have. And because we have a really wide discussion panel, I will be picky with uh, selecting the persons to, to answer this. And uh, I would like to get on the theory of the authorship uh, as we were discussing creative uh, work in, in terms of this. And I would like to start with uh, Al Alžbieta. Uh, if, uh, if she could get us an overview, like where are we uh, at the moment if we look at the images created you know, by using language models or uh, when once designers and artists are using uh, generative tools, uh, where's the authorship like from the point of uh, uh, law view? Okay, so uh, I will focus on the Czech law because copyright law is... Uh, uh, local in each country, it's a little bit different. Uh, so with the generative AI, we do have a bit of a problem because uh, the first of all, we need to look at, uh, I, I suppose that you are asking about the output. Who owns the output, right? Yes. Or who's, okay. who, who's the author, so, you know, of, of it? <laughs> uh, the, I would say that there is no author because the Czech law would say and most of the laws uh, in the world would tell you that actually author is a physical person, it's a human, it cannot be anyone else. And when you look at the definition of artwork, which can be both text or audio or uh, visual uh, output, any anything, so then the author must be a physical person and in order for it to be protected, there needs to be a significant uh, input like from originated from your mind. Uh, now the question is whether the prompt that you ask the generative AI or the, the, the order that you give it to create an image, whether it is enough of intellectual uh, input that you give into uh, the tool, let's say. Uh, and uh, there is a first uh, guidelines in the world, it's by uh, United States, and they said that the prompt is not enough when you create any work of art. In the Czech Republic, we still don't have any specific regulation, and under the current copyright law, actually any output produced by uh, generative AI would not be protected at all. It would not be copyrighted work, there would be no author, and it would be actually in a public domain. Uh, of course, you could pretend to be author and then maybe face some legal action from somebody else, but uh, supposedly you would not stand at the court to defend your rights as the author. In the United States, the, uh, the guidelines from actually 10 March 2023, so it's pretty recent, it says that output of the generative AI can be protected uh, by copyright law only in the parts that were not produced by the computer but by the person.
for instance, you get some textual output, uh, you edit some parts of it, and you leave the rest uh, unchanged, and the part that you changed should be protected by copyright. And then there you are author as a human, and the rest is not protected. But again, it's uh, causing quite complicated situation. And is there any uh, dev development in in the view edit, or and does uh, you know in a situation where you would get your own work into the uh, to the learning models that you know like the uh, language model would be based on your own work? Would this would there be any change in uh, in this? That's a very inter interesting question, and I think there might be change in that. Uh, although, like, because you would create actually generative work of your own work. Yes. So, um, well, actually, there is no definitive question by law, and it would be on the judge. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. But there, I think you might stand the chance because you actually say, "I rework my own work." So in that case, it's still my work. So that yeah, there is a slight change in that. Okay, that sounds and, cool. And this is this is exactly what your sponsor is doing as Adobe Firefly when it's coming out. Is is exclusively trained on Adobe licensed stock material. So everything you prompt in Adobe Firefly is then copyrighted and licensed. So this is the idea behind. Sure. Uh, then I would, I would give a word to uh, Jana. If, uh, if there uh, is any development in the point of view of, or from, from the point of view of uh, art history, like on, on the author and uh, being or producing work, you know, just based on text prompts, or how would you look at that? Uh, okay, so I think that in this case, I would uh, call the author, the author of the application we use, because we are users of some application that we, uh, I mean that mid journey and things like that. But in case when you create your own data set, you program your own software neural networks because you want to find there some certain items um, and uh, you generate it, then of course it's like your work. But I think that the future is in that new media art or in the digital art is to create these open systems and uh, leave there the opportunity to interact and to create uh, varieties of the outcomes on the side of uh, recipients. It's mm -hmm. not anymore the passive, uh, but more uh, like co-authorship uh, situation. Okay, like maybe I would ask Tim if he, has, uh, if he wants to add anything to, to this topic. To the topic of authorship? Yes. Actually, I have no idea. Actually. No idea. I don't Me, know. Neither, neither. Well, neither. I think, well, I just can't say what I feel like, but, but I think maybe this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so I will hand it over to someone else. Ah, okay, okay. So uh, I have a note. It's barely visible for me to raise hands, but uh, please, Sarah, go, go ahead. Hi, yeah, yeah, so, sorry, this is just a really interesting um, topic for me because humans steal ideas and it's really interesting that the idea of intellectual property is being discussed a lot with artificial intelligence and generative algorithms, but if we look at like famous people in history like Thomas Alva Edison, he's associated with 1096 patterns, most of whom he stole, um, not only for the motion picture, for the light bulb, for the fluoroscope, um, there was a lot of things that basically people in power just because they are in that power and they have that social capital take for their own. So we have to see the historical precedent in terms of taking um, uh, people's ideas as their own. And there's a really interesting discussion around this um, a few years ago with Article 13, uh, the meme law, where basically you have the meme community, uh, people are creating memes, it's an organic language, um, infinitely more uh, successful than Esperanto, but we don't really know who the original founders of those memes are or the creators because it's a symbolic language. Um, and that was something that was ridiculed by the meme community and like didn't end up being kind of realized. But we've seen this discussion happen many, many times before the start of generative AI. Um, for me, something that is phenomenal as a technology is blockchain. Um, the fact that you have a uh, record that uh, at least uh, as the status quo of the technology is, 
cannot be changed. Um, so it's actually being used quite a bit in the in the cultural sector in terms of proof of patronage, proof of uh, restoration of uh, of various historical artifacts. Um, but also uh, there's examples of companies like my title where scientists are starting to use blockchain for basically bypassing the patent system that is extremely slow and laborsome. So I'm wondering whether maybe the Web3 ecosystem might not prove uh, a more kind of fruitful discussion uh, for uh, the kind of legislation uh, being kind of like uh, circulated around the generative algorithms right now. Because if you have, for example, the prompt that you've given to ChatGPT or uh, uh, any kind of similar uh, software, um, and it is recorded on blockchain that that has taken place and that you've been the one who might have asked that question as the first person in the world, um, whether that might have some kind of like a hierarchical position in the law uh, where you can kind of start um, stratifying um, basically those requests and those prompts and kind of associating them with concrete people and like having that proof of ownership. So um, it's just a hypothesis, but th there's some really interesting things happening in that regard in the cultural sector as well. So just wanted to raise that aspect. Oh, that's just really interesting. Thank you for that. Linus, you, you, want, you wanted to add on, on that a little bit? Yeah, so just like Sarah says here, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, and I'm coming back from the question again where uh, authorship. So if we look at digital cameras, we're looking at a photographer. A photographer gets the right to a photo by pushing a button, right? And that's pretty insane uh, in my mind. Whereas if you're a good artist with AI tools, for example, it's a lot more complicated than, than pushing a button. So I think the, the the current situation where it's hard to d divide where what the ship goes in terms of like, is it the diffusion model itself? Is it the latent space within inside the diffusion model that is the author? We cannot put the authorship of the developer of the latent space because they have no idea what's going on inside of the black box of the model. Um, and then back to, so we're looking at that just like, it's okay if you're a photographer, you, you press a button, it's your your image, regardless if it's me naked on the other side, you own you own the right to that image. Uh, where, where it's like, if it's AI, the main debate has been like, well, we're stealing other artists' work. So I think like that that needs to change uh, because that's not entirely true. Uh, and then to like, how do we define, um, you know, if I was the first person ever in the world to, to ask a question to AI, for example, we still have the the thing that's called the seed number. So the, there's almost like an infinite amount of seed numbers to any given string or, or prompt that you operate. Um, so, so if I just change the seed by one factor, like one number, um, I get a completely different output. So it, it's going to be interesting to see because like there's just an infinite amount of possibilities from a single prompt. And then factor in that there are going to be almost an unlimited amount of models to, to choose from. So I think this this is a hot topic. Uh, and I think we're going to see, I'm probably going to see something similar to like how photographers are treated. Uh, hopefully that would be w w what I'm aiming for at least. <laughs> cool, thank you very much. I don't, uh, yeah, Alasbeta, go, go ahead. I see that you're raising a hand. You wanted to react on something, I guess. Thank you. Yes, uh, well, the, the debate is going in a very interesting direction. And my question is then, what are we, what are we going to protect? What is it that we are really protecting? When we are, uh, when we started with copyright, it was protecting original ideas that were actually uh, realized or executed in again in an individual way. So we protected both idea and the execution. The execution was much more crucial because ideas we cannot protect; they are invisible. The execution what was what was protected. Now with AI, we are shifting in a completely different way because we are shifting to ideas and the execution is being delegated. So what is the value that we want to protect? And uh, I think it will take a lot of, uh, you know, it, we will need to change our mindset completely because so far we've been focusing on the execution and right now we will need to focus on a completely different level. And now, uh, when I mentioned already the guidelines on the prompting and that actually uh, what's being prompted is not protected, we also need to think about originality of the prompt. But when Sarah said that actually uh, we could attribute the prompt to some other person, I am afraid of one other situation. And that is, for instance, if you want to register a domain name, then most of them are taken and this could happen as well. And there are people who are, whose main business is just to 
register domain names one after another. And this could again completely destroy the creative world because if we attribute the prompt to somebody else, nobody else is, uh, would they be able to ask it? Will they be allowed or will they be charged for asking the same prompt? How we will do it? There are so many unanswered questions that we will need to focus on. I also, I also want to add here that at the moment, <clears throat> all of these tools, so, so you, you use a, a different tool for every job, and I think you can also call it bundling. So if you have one project, you use these five AI tools and then the other ones, and then you have to, to think again about copyright. If you use now five different AI tools generating like on a climax and in the end you uh, compose them still in Photoshop because something's missing, whatever, because we are in a, in a something like a beta fast phase at the moment. So then the process of how this image or clip or whatever <coughs> is coming to life is cannot be um, documented either. So where is then the copyright to, to be set in? Yeah, yeah, cool. I, I would, yeah, yeah, yeah. Also comment. Uh, so maybe I would have like a like complementary view because I'm from a scientific community, and uh, I must say that it's uh, already actually Sarah said it's very hard to track uh, who is the author of the original idea. So there was already uh, mentioned that maybe the person who generated some content should be the author, or maybe the person who did uh, develop this tool. Uh, I would say that. Uh, uh, the tools that uh, currently are being used for generating images or text uh, are mostly based on open source software that has many authors. Uh, because if you really look at it, uh, it's, uh, it's like a whole process of the scientific community that was working for decades uh, on making these, uh, these uh, things happen. And now if you really want to just say, okay, the final person, the last one who did push the button, well, he's the author and he owns everything, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, if, you, if you look at it uh, from the point of view, like uh, why are we even like, uh, having the discussion about these uh, IP, IP uh, issues, like uh, we uh, as a society want to uh, protect uh, people who actually spend time to create something so that uh, uh, they actually do it, uh, they don't stop, you know, like uh, if you don't reward people for doing creative work, they will just not do it. So you really need to uh, give them some incentives for that. Uh, uh, it was already mentioned, uh, the patents were invented long time ago, didn't really work anymore for scientific community, like uh, you can ask uh, uh, the big companies why they are having the patents is just basically for some uh, protection against uh, against uh, patent trolls and uh, all these things. So I think that we as a society really should uh, rethink uh, our approach to IP because uh, in the end, uh, all of us are actually owners of uh, what is being generated by, by these AI models. Uh, if they are trained on, say, wall internet content, uh, then uh, really like uh, all of us that contribute to it somewhat uh, if you want to give credit to the person who, who did just uh, code the, the latest tool, again, that's, uh, that doesn't make sense because the tool itself is based on the work of uh, hundreds of people. So I don't want to sound like a communist, but in a sense, uh, we are all owners uh, of everything in this sense, uh, in the case of uh, this generative AI, and then trying to uh, like assign credit that's just so much work that, uh, in my opinion, it's just a waste of time. We shouldn't do it. We sh should just say, okay, this, uh, this is a uh, uh, result of, uh, of work of all of us, of humanity together and we all are authors uh, and everything is, you know, everything gets much simpler cool i'll give a word to jana and then to alžbeta okay it's really so. just a short comment i would like to quote uh, joanna zilinska author of the book about ai art and she calls it crowdsourced beauty the images we we generate and i think that this uh, 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 word, uh, somehow embodies both the authorship, that is crowdsourced somehow, and uh, also the quality of this, I call it rather like fun, uh, fun art, like uh, of fans of uh, the AI, because I think that we should differentiate case to case. Uh, we are now talking about authorship of AI images, but I can imagine so many different cases. For example, in art world we know ready-made. It means that I pick something and I will call it art and I will be the artist. Or, um, so it's really, uh, or I, I just take something and remake it, the hardware. And uh, uh, so I think that we should talk about 
certain cases, and there will be like different solutions for it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So uh, I'll give the word to Alžbeta. She was uh, raising her hand. Yes. Uh, just a uh, just a brief comment because when Tomáš spoke about how this is all collective work, I completely agree with that. But what's interesting also to look at is uh, the the contractual obligations or the statement that is with different generative AI services, because each of the companies are looking at those creations completely differently. For instance, ChatGPT says that any output that you generate is yours. They don't care about the law. They say, you know, it's yours, do with it whatever you want. But there are companies that actually consider everything that has been uh, generated by them, even based on your prompt. And even though they scrape the website, they scrape the internet, ignoring, uh, ignoring the intellectual property rights, etc. They say, whatever you generate, we still own copyright to it. And uh, whatever you generate, we own and we can learn again on it. So whatever prompt you give us, we take it as ours and we, uh, we take it into the system and we develop the system also based on the communication with us. So that's another thing how uh, that contributes to the whole ecosystem of this IP protection. It's also these contractual terms that are uh, different for each service. Cool, thank you very much. Uh, Alžbeta, just a practical question I wanted to ask. I know that your time uh, was limited to one hour. Like, will you have to leave soon or how long uh, shall um, we have I can, I can stay. Okay, okay. I was just, uh, if, 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 if I need, need to use my last question for you or not. And that, that, that's fine. So now, now I would like to move our discussion a bit um, towards a different topic. And uh, I would like to start with uh, Tomáš. And in terms of the technological evolution of the um, image gener generative tools, uh, do you think like you know the, the last debate when uh, Midjourney, Dalian uh, were were uh, able to be used um, publicly? Do you think that uh, this is somehow a, a rev revolution, or rather an evolution of like a, a lo long time of work? Or, and uh, were there any uh, surprising moments for you? Well, well that really depends because I think it's a, it's a evolution of the scientific ideas, but it's a revolution for, for the majority of the, of the, of the like, human population because most of, uh, most of the people are not scientists and they, they didn't really like, follow what, uh, whatever was published in the conferences in the last 10 years. Uh, so uh, when these tools became, uh, became uh, cheap enough to, to, be, uh, to be publicly released, uh, not just cheap enough, but there, there was also, also like this, uh, this big part was the investment where it became uh, large enough so that, uh, so that these tools could uh, have been uh, released uh, to the public. Then I think that for the public, it did seem to be really like a revolution, but again, for the scientific community, it's uh, it's a long process, and again, like I would not really like uh, uh, point a finger and say, okay, this uh, this one person or this one company did create everything. Uh, it's not true at all. If you actually look at, uh, for example, uh, the architectures of the language models that uh, that uh, ChatGPT is based on, that has been released by by people from Google, for example. Uh, so you know, like you, you can't actually just say that a single company did every, uh, invent everything. There's uh, much less of the scientific uh, advancements often than uh, than it seems to uh, to uh, to the public. Uh, uh, just uh, just when you have a new version of a product that, for example, has just a different data set that it has been trained on. So, uh, so again, like uh, it's uh, it's different for different type of people. Of course, for the artists or for people from. Uh, uh, from uh, I don't know, like marketing, it, it must uh, seem like a big revolution because there was uh, basically nothing that they they could use, say, uh, two or three years ago, and suddenly they have like uh, all kind of tools that uh, didn't exist before. So for them, it's it's uh, sort of like a big jump. Uh, so again, like it's uh, it's not uh, uh, simple to answer our question. It really depends on uh, on uh, like what is the perspective. And is there was there like any personal surprise for you? Uh, what what the tools uh, what the tools offered or like on the on the results of. Uh of their use. Well, I was uh, very optimistic, for example, about uh, language models uh, myself for a long time because uh, that's, uh, that's what I've been working on for uh, most of my career. So, in fact, I was uh, I was uh, like for a long time I was. Uh, 
feeling that uh, they are being underused and uh, still uh, machine learning in general is uh, not used in many domains where it would work uh, in a great way like say for example healthcare that's something that if you would ask uh, experts on machine learning from the like uh, 10 years ago like uh, most of them would actually tell you that uh, machine uh, machine learning is going to revolutionize healthcare that we are going to be much more healthy and uh, everything will just get much better it was te uh, technologically doable uh, 10 years ago but somehow it didn't happen yet uh, when it comes to language models uh, they also did exist like neural language models that exist 10 years ago uh, I, I was working on it actually that uh, like in the in the in the beginning and uh, I did feel that uh, they are being underused because uh, you know you can uh, improve a little bit incrementally say web search or Google or you can improve Google Translate where it was more visible uh, but uh, it was mostly like uh, these smaller things but uh, you could actually redo uh, some uh, some uh, like big uh, big um, products like uh, like for example web search uh, using uh, neural language models and I think that's exactly what uh, this uh, chat GPT is actually showing the way uh, but again like that was uh, doable even like five years ago if uh, if people would invest uh, into this so I would say the surprising thing is always like uh, when the society finally gets uh, gets the idea and it finally starts happening uh, uh, but sometimes it's uh, it's kind of like frustrating when you see that uh, there's so much missed potential and for example when there was this COVID I think it was so obvious that uh, the decisions made at random by people who are not experts at all or, or maybe just uh, present themselves as experts in the media I think that uh, all, our, all our society did, uh, did pay, uh, pay a big price for these failures if we had machine learning being part of a uh, healthcare system uh, already five years ago uh, the, the confusion uh, uh, in, uh, in this COVID situation would be much smaller and I think that all of us would, uh, would go through this crisis uh, much better so I'm, uh, I'm hopeful that uh, soon enough uh, machine learning will also like a, like a, like a result in a big revolution in the, in the healthcare domain uh, but so far uh, it's, it's not happening yet and uh, it's, uh, it's difficult to predict when it will happen it can happen like next year it can happen in 20 years from now technologically it's totally doable it's just about people to realize that, that this, is a, this is a possibility and uh, once people will want it uh, I mean like the general public then I think that uh, the revolution will happen Okay, I think t Tim was hesitant to uh, add to the discussion or not? Uh, on, on this? I'm not really sure, you know, this word, this word evolution, revolution is actually triggering some completely different thoughts in my head. Like, I would like to know, maybe ask the participants here at the panel, um, what kind of perspective do you have of, uh, about the, let's say, higher level consequences of AI? I mean, we are all talking about, like, copyright and things that are really related to, let's say, media. But I am especially concerned about the things that happen beyond our profession. And uh, maybe, I mean, maybe you can take a, <laughs> tell me a bit about that. Okay, I, I would like to maybe to respond to this. Uh, I understand your fear of the centralization of control through the machine learning and um, yeah, in the society. I'm actually not scared. I wouldn't say it's fear. I wouldn't more say it's more skepticism. Okay, so skepticism. But I think that um, in the field of uh, art, yes. I'm yeah. uh, there, I think that we are still um, in the very beginning of the development of AI art. I really think that what we are now testing is something like small toys for public to use to... Uh, know what AI can do, but there is not so many artists really uh, working on that um, some valuable, interesting artworks. For example, I like uh, Memo Akten and his uh, artworks uh, that brings totally new visualization, visualization that I call like collective self-portraits of humanity, because until now in the history of art, the portrait, self-portrait, is one genre. Uh, we have to use a complicated technological setting, like mirror, artist, uh, paper. I try to depict, uh, then I consult, am, am I, like, co is it correct or not? <laughs> but in the case of his artworks, for example, uh, I really find some new kind of spirituality, some kind of uh, general self uh, uh, self-portrait of the humanity. In other cases, um, uh, for example, that uh, spectacular visualization of data, I think it's really more tool for visualization of data than for generating new uh, like replicas of other images. And what is important in new media art, it's rather movement than the style. So new media artists always try to 
to, to open up the process how the artwork was done. And this way they can teach the audience how the AI really works, because they don't hide it. They try to, this was my data set, this was the tool, and this is what I want to, to tell with it. Without this information, it's really like black box, it's more like magician, but not artist in the field of new media. Actually, that's art. not what I meant. I'm more thinking about, like, let's say I'm more looking at the ethical point of view, like the effects on the higher level systems. Like we are sp all the time like speaking about the micro perspective, I'm speaking about the macro perspective. And instead of discussing, you know, let's say the very details of this micro perspective, I would like to discuss what's happening on the broader uh, level, right? What do you think? We're getting really huge. <laughs> it's getting <laughs> huge, but I think yeah, it's yeah, important yeah. because AI is a huge topic. It has a huge influence not onto design and media, Instead, it's changing really everything, right? So uh, maybe Linus, what is your take on this? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, is it okay if I answer? Yeah, yeah, sure. sure. All right, so I, I think the, the, the concern is valid. Um, I, I've spoken at a lot of places in the past few months, um, and I think one thing that I keep coming back to is that uh, regardless of, of the fear that's instilled in people, I'm not. You, you said you're not afraid, and I, I, I agree with that. I'm not afraid either. But I, the, the largest, the, the consequences on society will be huge, um, to put it lightly, because we've we've been through paradigm shifts before. If we, if we compare it to the industrial revolution, the industrial revolution kicked off like a long tail effect that basically made half of the population uh, transform their jobs. Like initially they got rid of their jobs and then they had to go and find other jobs and we transform, we adapt, we're humans, right? That took time. Um, we're seeing AI kind of go on a macro across the board, touching pretty much every vertical that we've invented, uh, except kind of blue collar work at this time. Currently it's hard to replace like a plumber, it's hard to replace an electrician, it's hard to, to replace artisans in general. Anything else, like high paid lawyer jobs to really high paid uh, specialist doctors, they're, they're all getting augmented with really high end AI that is purposefully trained to do their specific, like very specific tasks. And if we look at that, that, that there is a large threat, societal threat, uh, that if we don't thread carefully, um, we, we're gonna have to like have some really big and powerful debates. And since we don't seem to even be able to to agree on simple terms like human to human, I think it's gonna be very interesting to see like if we're gonna be able to agree around the impacts and you know legislation or like, how we're gonna kind of try to contain AI uh, as a global society because it needs to be global. Like if one country decides to go in a different direction um, and people you know side by that country, they will just go there and do their thing. So it, it, it's a big discussion that needs to kind of happen uh, on a global scale at the global stage. Cool, as uh, Linus, as we, we, we uh, have you now talking, I already wanted to, to ask you, uh, trying to circle around back to what, what I started with uh, Tomáš, as your Twitter feed is, uh, uh, has a, a new uh, almost design tool powered by AI every day, <laughs> uh, you, you know, like during the last time, was there for you any moment that you were really, really surprised by uh, what's what's possible, or do you uh, do you, uh, would you call that rather an evolution of you know uh, tools that that we have? So I just want to echo what we said before. This this looks for the general public it looks like an overnight success, but um, as we all know, there's no such thing. Basically, there very few things are. This is like a, a, a one two decade. Um, inch by inch kind of thing happening. And then all of a sudden the kind of the user interface is kind of determining factor here. And you know, GPT-3 has been around for two years. No, nobody, nobody looked, nobody cared. But then when the interface become like a chat interface, then all of a sudden it becomes a global thing. A hundred million people sign up in a month. Um, so it, it, to your question, like there are design tools, there are creative tools, and it's seemingly like an endless stream of new things hitting the marketplace. Um, what I'm most surprised is not about like a specific tool. I'm surprised about the speed, the speed of which these companies and the individuals and the researchers and the developers are improving. 
the the tools that they are releasing. So just we had this meme that was going around, you know, for for quite some months, how AI cannot do hands. You know, they're like six finger hands, ten finger hands. There are five legs on a horse, and and jokingly, you know, like the the the, the general public thinks that what that is the capabilities of AI, and and then you know two months later, it's it's like ninety five percent fixed. So if we look at other things in in software, it. It, we did not see these step changes. We didn't see these improvements happening on on this scale and 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 this speed. And if we think about it, we know we, we, so someone is talking about motion. Someone is talking about video. Like all of that is also going to be AI. We already have Gen two from Runway ML, where it's like text to video. You you put in some text, you get video output. And these tools are again just going to like improve at a rate that we have a hard time to understand. We are on an exponential curve. The, the change, the rate of change itself is exponent. So, you know, if you, if you had a hard time, you know, fathoming what's happened in the past six months, now try to draw out a timeline, 18 months, given the factor that, that the rate of change is also exponential. It, we, we're going to see more advancements in the next 18 months uh, than, you know, and than what we've seen in the past 10 years. So, again, to what I've said earlier, you, you need to you need to get on these tools um, and not because you're going to get replaced, but because you're going to have to learn these tools. It's like, imagine if all the cars all of a sudden started to uh, run on carrots and the only way to fuel them was to like put carrots in them. You would have to force yourself to become a carrot farmer. <laughs> like you'd have to <laughs> learn how to be a carrot farmer. It's the same here. We have to learn how to use AI. Uh, that's simple as that. Uh, I don't have anything else to add. Okay. Sorry for being so verbose. Cool, cool. Uh, uh, Sarah, did you did you raise your hand, or what? What did, wanted you add something on, on maybe like a surprising moment in the la last? Uh, year I'm, or so? I'm not sure whether I'm. Yeah, I'm not sure whether a surprising moment, but there was an interesting point raised about the effect it's going to have on our society, and I think one of the things that we struggle with, especially as Western society, is our egocentrism um, and our exceptionalism that we think that we have figured out the optimal way to run ourselves, you know, like the, the nation state, uh, and that's, that's just fantastic. Well, it's not like th there, there have been hundreds of ways of human organization of social organization in the last few thousand years. And I think that we do have to face the fact that uh, the nation state or anything uh, along those lines might die within our lifetimes. And that's fine. Like we've had a uh, huge civilizational organizations that were thalassocracies, that were basically empires on sea, that didn't even have a geopolitical representation, but they still functioned better, arguably, than any European state is functioning now. Um, a second point to mention is that 58.9% of human uh, population, or roughly that, I was uh, reading an infographic recently, um, live in Asia, um, specifically a majority in India and China. So we're having our uh, very important discussions um, here in the Euro-American context, but a majority of the development um, and, and, and the real innovation is happening completely elsewhere, plus with a different cultural perspective as well. So I think that what we need to be aware of is that um, the innovation is happening whether we like it or not. At the same time, I don't want people to be scared because AI is not AGI, it's not artificial general intelligence. They're hugely useful tools but uh, they're fundamentally automation tools. They're statistics on steroids. They're, it's not, not anything that's uh, in any way remotely similar to the Terminator or any, having any form of consciousness. It's just going to augment and change your job. But again, that's been here in evolutions and revolutions of the past so, so many times. And I think that we just have to let go of uh, the tradition to a certain extent and realize that there's other people and other social organizations living in the world apart from us um, and that we can also learn from them. And I think the interdisciplinarity of uh, perceiving the effect of AI on our society is going to be absolutely crucial. So I think it's great that there's a conference on AI and art happening, but I think that we uh, yeah, just need to be a little less egocentric and uh, give way to alternative social um, and uh, kind of innovative models that are around the world around us. That's a very, very, very nice point of view as well. I don't know if, uh, Tim, you, you are satisfied with the direction <laughs> of, uh, of your initial kind of uh, question, uh, but I, I wanted to make this uh, discussion panel uh, a, a bit more interactive. The upcoming that I discussion panel oh. is that was a bit what of was an that? AI in <laughs> interruption. An AI uh, no, voice, no, yeah. Now when I was taking a, 
control of our stream. No, uh, I would like to uh, make this a bit more interactive. And uh, as I mentioned this before, now I would like uh, each each of you, uh, if you could uh, come up with a uh, question for for anybody from uh, the panel, so you can uh, pick up uh, the the person and the field they they are specialized in and uh, get them their get them your question. If you want, you can start. I already did that. Yes. <laughs> you uh, already did that, but do you want to add one more? Maybe we start with Christoph. Yeah. Okay. Yeah? Let's do that. So um, the the. What I would find interesting is, as I said before, so you use this kind of working with AI tools in, in bundling, but if you think it one step further, so we are not talking about media consumption, we are constantly talking about media creation, and if you look at the future, I don't know if a website will look like a website or how do I consume my my feeds, so I will get information streams sorted and customized by AI. And what I think is, in storytelling, you always need friction and, and surprise. And so if I get my news feed or whatever entertainment streams selected by AI, do I end up in a TikTok world or is there a possibility for, with the AI to come up with this disruption and therefore errors and generation of interest. You know what I mean? Yeah, so is, is um, this a, then a question to anybody from yeah, the Yeah, so I, <laughs> I want to, to ask what everybody else is. Perhaps Linus, what, what, what's your perspective on the future of, of media consumption? All right, Linus, did you? Yeah. You, yeah, I think that's a very good question. I think uh, if, if we also start by the context that we, we're considering the world to be somewhat stale um, uh, with AI entering the face, I think we need to kind of change our pers perspectives on, on how media would look. Uh, we're, you know, if we're trying to squeeze in AI in the current context, then, you know, maybe, yeah, we might end up, you know, in a strange bubble. Um, but if we think about it that, you know, we will all have personal AIs. Um, just call them entities. And, and, and these AIs, uh, this is not far-fetched. This is not like 10 years out. This is probably going to happen in the next 12 to 24 months. We, we will have a, some, some AI that, that knows us very well. Maybe it's the evolution of Siri or maybe it's the evolution of Bixby, whatever. Um, th these AIs will kind of work as, as our curators, as our guards. Uh, they will know us better than maybe our partners or spouses does. Um, and they will be really good at, at kind of getting to us, get, getting to, to deliver things to us in a way that we appreciate. Uh, and, and why will we do this? Because we will constantly be reinforcing and pushing that feedback loop on like, you know, I don't like that or give it to me in a different way. I, I, I see this many times with people starting to use ChatGPT and they, and they go and they use it like um, you would use the first app on an iPhone, like the fart app. And, and they go like, it doesn't work. Yeah, because you're putting shit in, and if you're putting shit in, you're gonna get shit out. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. We will de facto become the curators and drivers of these tools, but then we will have extremely competent agents or entities that will, you know, learn and adapt to what you like. The problem I see is like with the next generation. I got two daughters, uh, one and three years old. And they basically don't interact with screens. Um, they, they they know that they exist, but their main point of interaction with technology is through voice. So my three-year-old, she, she only talks to the smart speakers. And the, everything she wants to do, she goes to the smart speaker, she asks it for something, and it does it for her. So I have a hard time discerning whether or not she will ever use screens in the way that I've done. She'll probably look at my kind of like career in, in, in creative industry, and she goes, like, Dad, why did you spend 20 years searching on Google? <laughs> Like you spent like 10,000 hours punching stuff into that search box. That's such a waste of your life. And, and in retrospect, it might look like that because she will have some sort of hyper intelligent, uh, you know, purposefully trained on her uh, entity that will know her. She, she, she just constantly have someone there that she can talk to. And, and the impacts of that, I think, are going to be hard to, to really understand and how that kind of translates to how she perceives information, how she receives data like from external sources is also going to be very strange. So, and again, this is not science fiction. I, I be firmly believe that this stuff will be here rather soon. Uh, and we're going to have to deal with that uh, somehow. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and this is exactly what it's uh, all about with this prompting, but because the prompting is also like a, a machine language, we, we said before, mm. that I am in, in conversation with the machine, and the next step would be then voice control. So that's clear. Yeah, if, so if, to add to that, like the, the way that I usually see this is like the, the, we're prompting to AI right now. It's like co co comparing to assembly code. Like when we st first started to, to interact with computers, we were writing very low level code. We're like directly talking to the silicon. And uh, the same kind of with large language models, we, we're, they are kind of tricky. You have to be like good at like telling it exactly what it is you want in a specific way. The prompt matters. And I, I can clearly see that go away and become completely natural language. Uh, and almost beyond that, like what happens when the machines kind of invent their own best way of communicating between each other? That's not even like our language. You just, just figure out a better way to do it. Um, but but yeah, from like short term perspective, we'll go from like being prompt engineers and, and designing the perfect prompts um, to become more like just natural speaking and the AI will understand what it is that we want. But we're not really there yet, but we will. And another thing that's very important to add here, every time you start a new session with ChatGPT, it resets. It has no knowledge about you. So if you're trying to use it as like kind of a personal assistant, you get tired of telling it like my name is, you know, my favorite color is, I live here, I do that. So again, we'll have these kind of layers where they already know us. So it's like, it's going to be interesting to see what that, what happens when we have that. And you can hack that together right now, but like it will be more kind of the, the default, the baseline will be that these things will know you. Yes, and, and recently last week, I. Do not know if you know in ChatGPT the Dan mode. This is paying into the ethical problems we have. So there's a, I think there's a prompt which is like one page long, and then you can unlock the Dan mode, which is then not paying tribute to ethical uh, trainings. And ChatGPT then gives you two answers: one in the correct sense and one in the creative sense. Right. This is uh, this is now locked by by OpenAI, and this is the problem with these models. We don't really know how they behave, right? Um, but this is what uh, human-based reinforcement learning is doing. Like, so they have this feedback loop where they have like thousands of people like just at seeing examples of what the output is, and they go, "This is right. This is wrong. This is right. This is wrong." And this is what OpenAI is pushing back into the model to fine-tune it, or as they call it, align it. And this human alignment is. It, in a way, the most important thing that we should focus on if we're talking about ethical training, uh, less about the data set and more about the aligning. Because if we think about like what, what, what Sarah said, uh, the world is a big place. And you know what's culturally right here is, is not culturally right somewhere else. So uh, OpenAI said this. I think people that are close to, to in both Microsoft and in Facebook have also said this, that that there might be that models actually are aligned differently based on locality. So like India, for example, you know, there's some restrictions of how things should be aligned there, whereas in Europe or in Sweden or in the US, it's different. So uh, it, it's trying, we, we cannot fit one model to solve everything. Like uh, it's just going to be impossible. Okay, cool. Yeah. S sorry, uh, if I can just... Yeah, we have oh. uh, two, two raised hands. So uh, I'll start with uh, Jana and then the, it was Sarah. Do, do I? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I would like to ask Thomas, <laughs> and I'm really curious. Okay. <laughs> so so uh, and I, I will just ask Sarah. Did you want it? Uh, Sarah, did you want it to react or uh, get your question out? Uh, no, actually, I wanted to react, and I also okay. have to go because I was told that this is going to be a shorter panel, and with us yeah, being no um, a little bit delayed, uh, I just. Sorry. Um, yeah, no worries, uh, no worries. So, uh, I, I told uh, react? my family I'd join them. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, um, no, I think uh, I think one of the big topics that we're kind of circulating around here is um, how humans perceive creativity. And in order to kind of understand that, we have to go back to 40,000 years to the Upper Paleolithic, where we actually have an explosion of um, symbolic art in, uh, in the archaeological strata, like the first musical instruments. You have one of the first uh, kind of examples of cave art, you can argue that this goes back millions of years, but there's a huge kind of change during the Upper Paleolithic. Um, and I think ever since then, the sense of abstraction um, that has given rise to byproducts like music or religion or the state uh, and the symbolism that holds us together, whether there's a national anthem or language or a flag, uh, those are the kind of things that we kind of perceive as creative and abstract. And we're worried for these things because we see them as inherently kind of homo sapiens related. 
Um, I, I really have to echo um, something that Damash said earlier, which is the interesting aspect of language in terms of kind of creating human civilization and also kind of creating human society, but also the interaction with computers, because uh, human language is the only kind of data interface that we have. Um, until kind of telepathy is invented in some kind of sci-fi future, um, I'm going to be talking, and I try to do that quickly, but nonetheless, my kind of data um, output is limited to you guys listening to me. And that is the kind of like only kind of data uh, interference that we have along with some things like body language or symbolic art and things like that. So for me, AI is fantastic uh, as a new kind of browser through all the huge amount of knowledge and data that we've accumulated. We have 25 times more digital data at the start of uh, this decade, at the start of last decade. So if I can have a more effective way of interacting with that data and finding insights from that data, you know, just as an archeologist, I use ChatGPT as a um, kind of uh, resource, um, as something that I do my research in. Sometimes it brings me back bullshit and that's fine. And you have to be aware of that, that just because it comes from a computer doesn't mean that it's true, but it just helps you much better than Google does at this stage for me. Um, so, so, so I think that the kind of language aspect of interacting with uh, computers and the mechanization of the world around us and getting better insights from the data that we've created as humans over the last thousands of years, I think it's great. And it's a great opportunity, whether you're a scientist or an artist, because I think that those two things are, are often very comparable. So, um, so I think, yeah, uh, we, we've, we've basically, we're still talking about the same principles for the last 40,000 years, just with better talk, technology. And I don't think there's anything to be scared of. I think the most fundamental thing is um, uh, to educate people uh, who are not traditionally trained in these subjects um, so that not just us uh, feeling happy about ourselves uh, you know, in this room, but also the average person in the street is not scared of some artificial terminator, but can actually use it effectively. Um, and I think that, uh, again, thank you so much, because I think this panel has done a great job of bringing uh, people who understand it infinitely more than me um, together to evangelize this topic. So uh, it's been an honor to be a part of that. Okay, so you're about to sign out. Do I un understand that correctly? Yes, yes, yes. That's, you uh, understand do, that correctly. Do, 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 do you have a last question to anybody from the panelists? So uh, you, you, I would just, you know, tick you off that you you got it. <laughs> yeah, uh, oh, uh, God. Uh, well, well my, so my, my science group um, deals with studying um, social complexity. Um, and we want to understand what, for example, um, a society is going to look like on Mars, because that's definitely not going to be any form of nation state. So my question would be, you know, looking for the beyond, um, where do you think that the automation of so much of our jobs, of so much of the boring nonsense admin work that we do, um, what that's going to lead to in terms of structuring our time? Because a five-day you know, working week is nonsense. It is an industrial tradition. Um, Eight-hour sleeping day, is, you know, that, that, that's nonsense as well. That, that's something that comes out of um, the mechanization of our kind of Western society. So I'm interested in what you think the next step might be in this new utopia <laughs> okay um, that i think that interests me scientifically and, and who, who would you pick from the panelists to to get to that question too because you know we're quite limited i'm so. going to be completely biased um uh, uh, and i'm going to pick the marsh uh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so did you, uh did I understand it right, the question that you were asking about like the, the future or uh, what was it? Uh, yeah, actually, because I was thinking about uh, yeah. a similar question myself. So, uh, so now, now my question is kind of like uh, gone. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> well, well, I actually wanted also like to ask uh, other people uh, to think about uh, this. Like uh, we are discussing basically what's going to happen maybe in the last uh, in the next uh, three, six, six months. There's going to be more tools that we are uh, going to be using and I'm basically like very optimistic about machine learning in general and basically AI like that uh, it's gonna make our lives uh, easier but at the same time maybe it's not gonna happen uh, uh, like equally uh, quickly uh, in all the parts of the world uh, it already happened was mentioned uh, before like uh, what's the worries about uh, about the future uh, then the industrial revolution as an example uh, where actually uh, some part of the world did progress much faster than some other parts and did, did it uh, this uh, did create uh, imbalances uh, uh, probably actually Sarah here uh, if, if she will still uh, remain uh, could comment on what happened for example to China after after basically Europe uh, did kind of like invent this uh, industrial revolution and basically the population exploded and uh, so did the strength of the armies and everything so so I think that uh, there's certainly a danger if uh, some parts of the world will develop much faster when it comes to AI than some others uh, and I'm actually a bit worried myself about uh, actually uh, our future like here in Czech Republic and in Europe because if we actually look at 
at this AI race, uh, then it's, it's being dominated by, by the US. Uh, uh, then there's uh, certainly China that is investing uh, tons of money very, very, I would say, intentionally in this area, uh, while some other parts of the world are more like the consumers. So we may end up a little bit like China 200 years ago, that we are feeling that we are on top of the world, we have all this uh, uh, incredible history and uh, we are untouchable. But maybe in five or ten years we will end up like being a little bit like a colony uh, because we will be just using the tools that are maybe built on the data that were produced by us, maybe on the scientific uh, discoveries that were also like uh, in part uh, developed by us. But we will be just buying uh, products uh, uh, that will be sold to us by monopolistic companies and uh, we will lose uh, this economic battle. So that's uh, in my view actually one of these uh, macro dangers uh, that, we can, uh, that we can predict that uh, maybe millions of jobs will disappear but if they will be replaced by the tools that we will be buying from uh, from uh, just a few companies outside of the Europe, then maybe the world will become richer, but uh, uh, Europe may actually become poorer. So, uh, so that's maybe my kind of like uh, follow up on actually the previous question from like half a year ago, uh, half uh, an hour ago. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, it was really good. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, now, uh, Sarah, do you, do you want to, to to react before you sign oh, out or? So, so Oh, sorry, I just wanted to say thank you for the answer. And yes, that has indeed happened before with the Opium Wars uh, and the East India Trading Company um, in the 19th century and then the British colonization of Hong Kong. So yes, <laughs> these things happen. Um, and these cooperativist wars have happened uh, many times in the past. Um, and thank you so much for the answer. And thank you again for having the honor to be on the panel. And I hope that you enjoy the rest thank of you it. Thank very, you. Thank you very much. It was great having you. And we're going to continue without you. Bye, Sarah. Now uh, I, I give uh, I, I give uh, space for uh, for Jana for for her okay. question to run event. So my question was uh, that we are talking here about artificial intelligence, but in fact we are talking about the machine learning. Uh, technology, uh, as Thomas call it, applied statistics. And uh, I would like to ask some insiders, maybe I, I wanted to ask Thomas, but I don't know <laughs> now, maybe some other will also try to answer. If there is uh, somewhere behind the uh, walls of uh, scientific laboratories developing some other way, the AI, but another way, because I think it's not, uh, as, um, I think that we all understand the AI as a model of a uh, human mind. And it's the narrative around it is like we are going to build a model of human mind, perfect simulacrum, but much better than us. Uh, and, uh, but we know that it's just one part of the intelligence we are now developing. And uh, it's probably the part that is... Uh, that we have common with that machines. <laughs> uh, but I am wondering if there is some other way, other technology, other testing uh, approaches to this AI to, to develop. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave it to Tomas then. Okay. <laughs> well, well uh, certainly like uh, the AI field is much, uh, much uh, bigger than just the machine learning. Machine learning is a subset uh, of, uh, of uh, all the AI research. Uh, at the same time, in the scientific community, often there's this uh, uh, case, kind of like this hard thinking, like, uh, uh, you know, like uh, when, when there's something popular, you get much uh, much more funding for, for, this, uh, for this direction. So there are certainly different areas that are not based on the statistics, like uh, uh, symbolic reasoning or, or whatever, agent systems. Uh, uh, there's, uh, there's actually a lot of other topics uh, that may also lead to, uh, maybe to AI, but uh, if there will be no investment and no funding and no people actually joining, uh, joining these areas, then the development there will actually uh, become much slower. So actually, that's, uh, that's my worry as a scientist that uh, uh, on one hand, I, I, I like the, uh, the, the statistical approach to, uh, to, uh, to AI, and I like machine learning. That's what I was working on myself uh, uh, when I started uh, uh, this as a student. Like It was like 2006, I remember it was the time when uh, neural networks was like uh, something that was uh, widely acknowledged as, uh, as, uh, as a model that will never work. Uh, 
And that's basically like just something uh, that uh, that some fools play with. Uh, uh, when you would mention the word the word AI, like artificial intelligence, as your ambition, everybody would laugh at you at you because it was uh, it was considered to be uh, totally like unrealistic uh, uh, goal. And I think that this uh, this totally changed. Like in some sense, the scientific community did uh, did turn like 180 degrees, and uh, now uh, it's all about neural networks, all about AI. Uh, but at the same time, mm, I feel that. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's not optimal when we are some, uh, too much sure about whatever is the current mainstream. I would uh, prefer if there would be more like a exploration of different ide ideas and not just uh, exploitation. If I would, for example, give an example, if you go now to uh, machine learning conferences uh, uh, or AI conferences, uh, uh, there will be like thousands of papers that you will see that are being published uh, uh, every year. But they are basically about like uh, recycling, basically two or three ideas again and again, and uh, that's uh, that's not a very efficient because uh, you have basically uh, thousands and thousands of PhD students who are very smart and uh, who have basically limited time to uh, to accomplish something in their in their scientific career, but they are basically just doing the same thing, like kind of like uh, having thousands of clones all around the world uh, doing uh, exactly the same stuff. So I think that uh, it's a huge missed uh, opportunity, but uh, that's more like about how our society works, how uh, the scientific community works. Uh, how can we ensure that we uh, we actually uh, get richer in this exploration? And I think that uh, it's uh, and like uh, unsolved uh, problem because many people realize that this is the case. Uh, but. Uh, but we still are basically in the situation. And uh, as you were asking, yes, there are different areas uh, how we can approach AI. Uh, not everything is machine learning. Uh, uh, and while I did think that uh, that neural networks, for example, were like uh, underexplored uh, some 15 years ago, today I just uh, feel that they are heavily overexplored. Of course, they they are great and they they uh, they lead to great applications. Uh, but uh, we should not be betting all our money on a single thing. Cool, thank you very much. That's a really, really great look at that. Uh, I wanted to give, uh, yeah, and also Ashbita raised her hand. I wanted to give her a uh, voice. I don't know, don't know if you want to react. You can react, and also uh, you can get your question out to somebody from the panelists you, you, you pick. Okay, thank you. I want to react, and I actually do have a question for uh, Linus. Uh, so first the reaction, because I, I found this question extremely interesting. What's next or what else uh, apart from machine learning? And one of the areas that I think, I personally think is the next step in creating intelligent systems is interconnecting of biological systems with IT, with AI and with the hardware technology. That actually we will have robots that interconnect like a, biological brain and technological interface and uh, together they will create even more, uh, hopefully even more intelligent uh, uh, machines and our way of uh, behaving and uh, solving problems. Uh, there, there are actually already, when Sara mentioned, uh, one day if we invent uh, telepathy, uh, we will uh, transform ourselves into new ways of communicating. There are already systems that enable that uh, for us with uh, chips in the brain, with uh, EEG and other technologies that translate and send signal with help of AI from one brain to another that help us control bodies. So that was just a remark. Uh, now, if I may uh, then pose my question to Linus, uh, I was fascinated by how he mentioned uh, that his daughters are controlling those interfaces just by voice, that everything is speeding up. And I made some notes and uh, it comes to my mind that maybe one day we are going and very soon going to live in a multi-level speed society because some people will live really fast and some people will, uh, compared to them, live very slow. And my question is, where do you think is the limit? Where do we stop? Will it be the audience? Will it be like that some people will simply refuse uh, how fast we are going? Or do you think it will be our brain capacities that will stop us? Or do you think that one day we will go in a speed of life that like, that like we, anything we think of instantly we execute in the world? That's a very nice question. So, Linus, your yeah. Well, how do I follow that? Um, yeah. First of all, I think I, I I agree with the whole kind of like 
society will will run at different speeds and this is one thing that i'm i'm uh, personally quite worried about and the reason why i'm sharing a lot uh, of my learnings when it comes to like m my expertise and and how i see my peers that are uh, learning about tools how they run a lot faster than other people in their industry and the gap that creates uh, it's not always a positive gap. Um, so, so kind of my whole thing of why I'm sharing so much is I want to try to decrease that gap. But if we look then on a, on a, on a larger scale where, you know, the, the world as a whole, um, we will have to live with this because we, there's going to be people just like there are people today that don't use electricity, right? Um, that, that are not wanting to do these things. And I think we're going to see a more nuanced society in that way where technology kind of will have to go away like we're now in the you know the smartphone era where you know people are looking down into their phones and you see this everywhere and i think we're, we're slowly or we're fast if you depending on like your point of reference uh moving away from that um you know i can see clearly with my daughters that they they, they won't be that generation they won't continue that trend um then the problem you know the question to ask is it going to be more like um, Ready Player One, you know, we're we all going to live in a simulated world. Is this world simulated? We don't know yet. Um, you know, this all these things that kind of like, w it's hard to foresee, but um, to paraphrase, I think, um, Oscar Wilde, um, you know, life imitates art. So whatever the science fiction uh, authors before us dreamed up, we're kind of living in that science fiction now, although the, the solutions might be slightly different what they envisioned. My house is fully automated. You know, my, my front door opens when I closest to the, get close to the house. I got robots cleaning for me while I'm doing a talk. You know, there's things going on where I've augmented away all the boring shit in my life, right? And I kind of live in the future already. But the future that my kids will live in will be completely different uh, in the sense that I've lived from seeing the Game Boy to seeing the, you know, the start of the internet to now be, you know, at the precipice of artificial intelligence and, you know, beyond. They start where artificial intelligence exists. Th their Game Boy is artificial intelligence. So again, it's going to be very difficult to understand how society will look the, the only thing that we will have to kind of acknowledge is that it will change and as pointed out by sarah before it has already changed phenomenal many times in history before it's just that we never had to deal with this type of change if you're alive today you never had to deal with this type of change except if you're very like at the end of your lifespan perhaps and you lived you know at the very end of the world war and you've seen parts of the industrial revolution. Those people have memory of of of, of strange times, but most people um, don't. So, yeah, um, it it is going to be very exciting times, but also, you know, a big place for philosophical thoughts. Um, yeah. <laughs> Okay, cool. Go on. So, yeah, yeah, probably the, the uh, limits limits are very very broad. Like my favorite sci-fi movie is Time Cop, so I'm really looking forward to time travel. And uh, uh, I don't know if Tim wanted to uh, add add something. Yeah. Uh, check check. Okay. <laughs> um, this I would love to hook in a question here because that's uh, really exciting what you said, Linus. For me, as a, a design educator, I, I work in you know loads of universities all over Europe. Lately in Barcelona. Um, and I have a community of 700 design uh, students that I run where I create a curriculum for creative coding, which is actually, uh, which means, well, uh, programming with an artistic purpose, right? So I would love to know, because that's a discussion that I also um, explored in my master thesis that I uh, wrote last year, uh, what you think, what we should teach young design students like you know when i stand in front of the class or i creating a course what do you think what is important in times of ai and this uh, yeah this disruptive processes perfect and who is this question going to i think uh, it, it it hooks in well very well into what linus said so maybe i put this to linus and then after to christoph okay <laughs> <laughs> you've picked two yeah well played. <laughs> it, uh, it's very, that's very nice. Um, so in terms of creative coding, for example, I did, I did the thing yesterday because a friend of mine and me work on a project and he's like, I want a sphere that reacts to audio and um, I want it to like, you know, circle and oscillate. And I'm like, and he's like, it's going to take a lot of time. And I'm like, 
scratched my head and I'm like, it can't be that hard, can it? You know, open up GPT-4, uh, was asking a bunch of questions, open up Replit, and, you know, a few seconds later, um, I have an inkling of what I wanted to do, and 20 minutes later, I have a full functioning um, app that does exactly that. It's like a sphere that rotates, has a point cloud data, and it reacts to my voice. So if you're teaching creative coding, <laughs> I don't know how to code for shit, right? <laughs> But I could get that output uh, into code, and now it's running, uh, and, and I don't even know the stack because I don't even have to. <laughs> um, so that's that's that. Uh, what do you have to teach those kids uh, and, and students? Like I think just you know talk AI, H have them experience doing it, like from understanding the code and doing it that way. Because like, if you have code understanding, then this would have been a completely different ballpark. But then have them do the same task but using AI. And then maybe the, the the intersect between understanding how to do it like by hand, like the artisanal way, and then also being able to do it with the help of AI might uh, lead to new discoveries and new ways to work with tools where like, well, maybe I can do this part in code, but then I just extend the rest using AI. Thus, as been said earlier, remove the autonomous work, the stuff that really sucks spending your time on. And you can like spend that time on being creative instead and have AI execute the boring stuff, right? So that's what I, that, that's, that's where I would, would put my kind of like recommendations. I wish I could share my screen now and you could all see the point cloud. Is that possible? I don't know if that's possible. I try. I'll ask our, yeah, seems There so. we go. So this is what you've you created. You see the cloud. Yes, today? Yeah. Okay. Yes, <laughs> and it's running. Here is the code and uh, it was all done by AI. I didn't write any of it and okay. uh, yeah, it works. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna stop scaring. <laughs> nice proof. So uh, I, I give a word to Christoph. Yes. Um, so I'm I'm come I'm seeing this from a different direction. So if you <coughs> standing in front of the class and you want to to explain them the the future of of the AI impact, I think I would remind them of where it is all coming from because it's always repeating itself and. Um, AI is nothing more than a pattern recognition and pattern comparison, and you have this also, like uh, in the back in the days at uh, Herbert Franke, something like this. Mm. And um, the next step would be to to ramp them up in in this conversation with the machine, as Linus said, it's nothing else as a very low assembler code, which will then in the future switch to a more or less yeah conversation like we we see in ex machina for for example and but at the moment i think it's you can also compare it to autonomous driving because this is only making sense if every car is autonomous because then you exclude the the mistakes humans can make and therefore ruin the system. So I, I also have like conversations with colleagues, for example, who, who then want to, yeah, like I do not show you my prompt because it's, it's like, uh, I think we, we all have to contribute in this phase of, of the beta system testing we are in to, to move things forward. So if everyone is, ramping up in the system, I think there will be more and, and faster success. Okay, so we all live in the beta. I just want to add something, because I wrote about this, and my point is that I would say we have to learn to face challenges like, you know, this disruption that we are experiencing right now. We have to see that we learn how to become more resilient when it comes to those kind of disruptional processes, because that's something that happens, you know, on a philosophical level. And um, yeah, from me, from my point of view, um, I think coding still teaches the, the students very much about thinking, about the th thinking processes on a very low level. So you learn computational thinking, which is kind of a you know bundle of different methods, which is really helpful. Um, yeah, but uh, it was really interesting to hear these uh, perspectives. Thanks. Cool. But now I give a word to Tomas, if he if he can uh, get his question. Uh, out to any anybody of the uh, panelists. Yeah, yeah, probably very quickly. I have uh, already at our meeting because I didn't expect <laughs> that it will take so <laughs> so long. Uh, so perfect uh, timing. Uh, like give give, uh, give it there. And 
Yeah, I would say I would just uh, a little bit repeat what I was say, saying before. Maybe what is uh, what is the kind of like a prediction for the future? Like uh, it's basically for everybody on on the panel. Like uh, what can we expect from like five or ten years from now uh, that uh, will happen with this new technology? I um, I don't really think that it's uh, it's comparable to uh, to industry evolution what we are experiencing. But at the same time, uh, certainly there are big changes in the society that are happening, and uh, maybe it's uh, it's a good thing to plan a, a little bit ahead like what, uh, what are the next moves uh, so that uh, we are actually prepared. Uh, of course there's a lot of dangers uh, of AI that are being discussed well uh, where I actually think some of them are overhyped but at the same time some of them are not discussed in my opinion enough and uh, again like I think that uh, uh, from my experience I did, uh, I did live uh, for many years in the US and I think that uh, the mentality of the society there is uh, much more much more kind of like straightforward uh, people discuss more like things like how to make money how to make successful business how to how to make things happen and in Europe I sometimes feel that we are often like going uh, through too long discussions with too many side uh, ideas side projects and uh, we are losing the focus sometimes by by just discussing too many of uh, of the secondary things so again like uh, uh, my question would be what are the biggest uh, challenges in front of us for the next five ten years not the humanity as a whole but uh, Czech Republic or Europe in, uh, in general and uh, what are the dangers and how we can how we can actually overcome these dangers and I will leave this question here for the panel and uh, and I will I will be already having to leave so okay so, thank, yeah, you, yeah. thank you thank you very much Tomasz. it was a pleasure to have you <laughs> Maybe I, um, I, I, I have a, I think I have a point. I, I think the, the best thing that I can imagine that happens in the next 10 years is that we uh, evaluate what kind of um, aspects of AI are really useful and which are really destructive, right? That we um, find out, kind of we build an ethical operating system to uh, make sure we do the right decisions and in the end also embrace the lower technologies that are also solving the problems. Um, that, that is what I would love to see. More low-tech and not, you know, less hype, maybe. Cool, yeah. Maybe I Diana? would uh, tell, in the, also in the, uh, but in the context of uh, AI art, I would say, or I, I expect that we will be, there will be like avalanche of uh, AI images, sounds and texts, and we will be not able even to see it as it was already said, it, we just produce and test and play with it, so nobody will be interested anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but there will be still the need for um, uh, the quality and our ability to uh, differ between the fun and the art. Uh, someone who really used the tool to uh, share with us some original uh, point of view on the world or, or some critical approaches to share uh, with us. And so um, I think that it's important to write manifesto of AI art, <laughs> to be able to guide us to the future of AI art. And uh, I would like to teach my, my students, who are like mostly theoreticians of uh, new media art, to be able to differ between like common fun and uh, between something that is really unique, rare, worth to write about it uh, and uh, focus the, the attention on it. Because, um, for example, I asked my student, he's in the video game industry, and he told me that he uh, expect like boom of that indie games, but that it was here already, and there was not enough audience for this kind of uh, experimental game. So, um, I think it, in the future there will be a really fight for attention of the audience, boom of uh, ma marketing tools uh, of different power, and um, yeah, and in this way we should also promote the high quality AI art. So okay, perfect. <laughs> that's a, that's a very nice point. Uh, I would like to hook into here as well because yes. I think AI art yeah. is something. At my current point of view, I think it's really important because that art is actually the way to, to reflect on the things that happen in AI and what AI actually does to the, to the world, right? So I think art is a really, really important um, channel to get a vision of what AI actually is for people that are not technologists, right? So um, yeah, 
I would love to read that manifesto, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would also mention just Vladan Ueller, maybe you know him. He's AI artist, or I, I see him like this, but he doesn't do any prompts or AI machine learning artworks, but uh, he draws complicated blueprints, how the AI works. And that's, for example, the way how artists um, approach this uh, problem of uh, uh, complication of the reality where the fakes and uh, real person and bots merge. We don't know what is true, what is uh, like false. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's the one of these approaches. That's, that's funny because last week at the agency we had a, a little game. It was called Guy or AI. So we, we trained the GPT-4 to be... Um, Award winning uh, copywriter and let them write uh, headlines for a beer. And then we asked some colleagues, copywriters also to, to write these lines and we showed it to the, <coughs> to the meeting. But it was uh, quite impressive how, how close the GPT <laughs> came to, to the, yeah, to the to tone of voice, I want to say. Not, not, not sure what does it say about the GPT or, you know, like the ad advertise <laughs> the advertising in general. But or the, yeah, or the no, beer. No. Jo jo <laughs> or the beer. <laughs> yeah. oh, oh, jo 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 jokes aside. Uh, I, I was happy that uh, Jana mentioned uh, earlier Me Memo Aikton, a bit of a self-promo. Self we had him uh, as a presenter several years ago. And uh, he did a marvelous talk on machine learning uh, Art. You can have a. You can watch this presentation on our uh, Movo TV channel. And uh, now I would go to uh, Linus, probably with the last question uh, of him to anybody from the panelists. If I remember, you were you're the uh, last remaining one who didn't get a chance to ask a question. Yeah, maybe I need to. <laughs> <laughs> maybe Tim. Um, given that we're like, I'm not sure if we're on the same side or on the, on the different side here in terms of if we're liking uh, AI or not. Um, so I, I just saw a tweet uh, that you made like asking uh, ChatGPT to do creative coding is to asking a stranger to <laughs> chew on your food. Um, maybe I was paraphrasing that slightly, but could you expand on that slightly given that I just showed you creative coding using ChatGPT? <laughs> Check, check. Hello. Okay. Yeah, this is a this is a great one. It, actually, this this post on Instagram got like two thousand two hundred likes or something. It was really crazy. About one hundred comments. So the 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 uh, quote that I came up with it was my own uh, uh, invention. I gotta say, uh, it was um, creative code creative coding with ChatGPT is like asking a stranger to chew your food, and this goes back to a definition of creative coding. Um, <laughs> that is written by uh, Mitchell and Baun. They say that then they emphasize that creative coding is actually a process that happens in your head, right? It's not really a, it's not really about a, just a creative tool. It can be a creative tool in in a workflow, also in a design workflow. But actually, first of all, it's a cognitive process. Um, it's a creative. Um, method that you can use to work completely without a goal. That means you go in a flow and go in a dialogue with a computer and start just to create from by intention. And by collecting all these results, all these outputs, you start to iterate through them and reflect on the, you know, the, the stuff that you just created, let's say, one week before. It's a little bit complex to explain, actually. But what I want to say is, from my um, definition, creative coding is something where it's a learning process. It's something that gives you an idea of how you think. It's a way to reflect yourself on how your cognitive processes work. And I find there is a lot of value in this because I've personally learned a lot in the last years learning creative coding um, about myself. And uh, yeah, I just want to say that, you know, for me it's much more than just a tool to create art or design. It's more something that, it's, it's a mindset. It's a much more holistic thing. Okay. So, so okay, can I, I just want to respond. So like, sure. I, I think it's very interesting. So you, you, a few words that just stands out to me is like reflect uh, and learn and like flow. So 
Uh, I, I don't really come from a coding background, but I'm a creative and I, I've, I, I look at a lot of code uh, and I actually teach kids like P5 uh, way back when. So I know some coding, oh, cool. but I never wrote a custom shader, for example. And um, so for this project that I did, that took me about 25 minutes, I marveled afterwards because GPT-4 helped me write a custom shader and exactly what I wanted. Uh, but then, you know, when I had the shader, I could look at the code and I could go, hey, wait a minute, what if I do this to the code? What if I do that? So in a way, my tutor for this, like for this little project, was essentially GPT-4 um, because I didn't have access to anyone else. But like obviously, if I had access to someone that knew this stuff, they would probably ask them. Um, so it's interesting because like from where I'm sitting, I managed to kind of self-start and get into like I didn't know where to start, so I had AI help me. And then once the AI had helped me, I could start tweaking. I could go, well, I don't like the sine curve of that, so I can just tweak those values. Or I don't like that, so I can play around with that. And you know, if I, what happens if I remove this? Oh, I break it. And I, I just find that interesting because I, I was finding myself in a flow state, but without um, having to deal with the overhead of not knowing. So for me, it's almost like a democratization of access where, like, Maybe before I'd had to know a lot of basics to just get started. And now all I needed to do was to use natural language. Like I, I could describe kind of where I wanted to start and the AI didn't get it right because it needed to reflect. That's the problem that I see most people getting at with like, not not in this conversation, not exactly on this topic, but the um, chat GPT and a transformer in general is an autoregressive model. So it doesn't know the end uh, of something in its response until it actually gets to the end. So for the best use case for, for any of these tools is basically asking it to reflect afterwards. Now that you've done X, how could you improve it? And then use that. So I think that's why coding for me, like using it this way, it's interesting. But I also agree with a lot of things that you're saying. Like it's, we need to teach these things for, for people to actually have a better understanding of what's going on in the black box. But I'm also like on the other side saying like, oh, this is fairly cool. Like I could go from zero to 50 without knowing anything and start from 50. So I'm, I'm sensing like maybe a definition change or like a new field perhaps entirely where AI is like helping us, augmenting us or our ability and making it easier for more people to access these things that maybe previously were afraid of touching, let's say code. Uh, so that was a lengthy answer, but I just wanted to point that out and I, I agree with everything that you're saying as well so uh, it's just having to have having to hold two of those uh maybe opposite uh, things in the head at the same time uh, so yeah I would like to hook in this, into this again because you have actually been been creative coding. <laughs> that is creative coding. Like you have a piece of code that you wrote, then you start tweaking the values and so on. This is the playful part of it, right? But the problem is when you use ChatGPT, for example, or ChatGPT4 or whatever comes in the future, um, you have no idea actually which directions you can go, right? What you showed was a very standard shader. It was a piece of code that you can copy paste from GitHub easily. So it's there's no expression in it. There's just it's just just a tech demo. That means there's nothing uh, concrete, no, there's no sem semiotic impulse that is meaningful. And uh, that is something that, um, like, the, this is the first thing you, the first impression you have when you use ChatGPT for creative coding. You get something, you find it flashy because it's complex, but actually it has no real expression. There's nothing in it that makes it individual, interesting, and fitting to a specific thing you want to express. And uh, yeah, that's why I believe that it's really helpful to know the whole system of possibilities, to know where to direct the system to make something that really expresses something uh, important. Yeah, you know, something concrete, something that makes sense. Okay, perfect. Uh, I think we're about to finish with our time, and uh, I would like to give you um, a small prompt to uh, each each one of you. Uh, to end up with, and uh, it would be like if you could get me like in uh, one sentence your advice to uh, uh, creative people or like people from the creative industry. Uh, one advice, like uh, how to think about uh, AI in the future. Uh, we can start with uh, anybody of you. I don't know, maybe with uh, Christoph, and then we go in line and online. <laughs> so you you want me to say what how I do. No, no, no. Give a, give a one one sentence advice to creative people how to think about AI in the future. It will do the work for you, which is annoying in zero time. 
Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Chet Greenberger. For I would <laughs> say learn to think instead of learn to prompt. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Jana? Okay, I would suggest uh, learn some, how the machine learning works and try to use it some other way, not as a statistic tool. <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you very much. How's beta? AI cannot be there without you. So your individuality will be much more important in the future than has ever been. Okay, thank you very much. L Linus? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I, w I wanted to say <laughs> adopt, adapt, or die, but that's too harsh. Uh, I think what echoing. So uh, these tools can never take away our humanity. Like we're always going to be humans and we're always going to have the upper edge. We know we have a shut off button, a red button somewhere we can push. So if you're a creative person, as I, I hear most of you in the audience are, uh, continue to be creative and continue to look at these things as tools, so just as a hammer or a nail or a saw, uh, but learn them. Like I, I urge you to go out there and just play with them. Be, don't, don't be afraid of them. That was a bit of an imperfect one sentence answer, but thank you very, <laughs> thank you very much. It was a nice one. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much, all the participants. I think we're going to have a really interesting evening uh, d debate after <laughs> all, all this on the bar. So thank you very much and uh, see the rest of you after the break.